Can you imagine that long, long time ago, our ancestors did not have fire in their home? Ago, our ancestors did not have fire in their homes. In fact, they did not even have homes. I wrote a story about it, and uh, here it is. They lived in caves. They lived in caves. Everything they needed to do. To Everything they needed to do to sustain their lives gathering and eating food, making clothes and tools, they did during the day. And when the darkness would come after the sunset, all they could do is to go into their cave and sleep in beds that they made from dry leaves, grass, moss, and occasional bird feathers. These were not even beds but big fluffy piles where they would bury themselves deep to keep themselves warm through the night. Back then, people knew fire only as forest fire started by lightning. They were terrified of the fire and spoke about it as the scorching beast that destroys everything on its way. They were teaching their children to run fast and far from the beast as soon as they see its bushy gray tail rising into the sky. In one such tribe, there was a young boy called Fai. Every day he would go out into the forest with his two other brothers and his mother to gather edible plants and mushrooms, while his father hunted for rabbits and wild turkeys. Every night he climbed back into the family cave where he made himself his own bed pile in a spot that he cleaned of rocks littering the floor of the cave. One cold winter night, Fai woke up needing to pee so badly. He did not want to get out of his warm pile, but he had to. He was accustomed to walk around the cave in the complete darkness, but this time he was in a hurry. And he tripped over a rock, badly hitting his toe. The pain was so sharp that Fai cried out, mad at the rock, that got into his way. He grabbed the nasty rock and he threw it against the wall of the cave angrily. The noise woke up his parents and his brothers. As soon as they figured that there was no danger to their lives, they yelled at Fai to keep quiet and went back to sleep. But through this entire commotion, one thing caught Fai's attention. He noticed the tiny shooting stars that flew through the darkness the moment the rock he threw hit the wall of the cave. He remembered that he was on his way out to pee. Fai did that and then went back to his bed. 
That night he dreamt about shooting stars. The next day Fai did not go out with his family into the forest, pretending to be sick. When he knew nobody would hear him anymore, he started throwing rocks against the wall of the cave. Many, many rocks he threw against the cave walls, against each other, till he found two rocks that shot the tiny stars when banged against each other. Fai was thrilled. Again and again he banged the rocks, fascinated by the shooting stars they sent flying around. A few tiny stars landed on his bed of dry leaves. They did not die there, like other stars, which lived a short moment before disappearing. Instead, some of them grew a little bigger. Curious, Fai sent a bit more stars onto his bed. And then he noticed what appeared to be tiny streaks of grey fog rising from where the stars landed on the dry leaves. Unlike the sweet morning fog that danced over the dew in the nearby meadow, this one had a bad smell. Fai started blowing air, trying to disperse the fog. But the air made the stars on the dry leaves grow bigger, which in turn made more fog. Fai threw more leaves and grass on the stars, trying to bury them and stop them from making more foul fog. For a few moments he thought he succeeded, till all of a sudden, the fog appeared from under every leaf of his bed. It grew very thick, very fast, and soon it was hard to breathe in the cave. And then bright red tongues of an animal never seen by Fai before showed from under the leaves, licking the leaves and turning them into little black and gray scorched pieces. In no time, Fai's bed was all covered in hot, red, dancing tongues, breathing suffocating fog into Fai's face. Scorching beast! Scorching beast! The cries outside the cave jolted Fai into action. He turned towards the cries towards where the cave entrance should have been, hidden by the veil of thick fog, and he started running. Fai and all the people of the tribe ran till they were deep in the forest. A strong young man volunteered to climb the tallest tree around in order to look if the scorching beast was following them or not. From the top of that tree, he reported that the beast stayed behind and that his fog tail seemed small, which meant that the beast was getting weaker. That night, people of Fai's tribe spent out in the woods, warming each other only by the heat of their bodies, young men keeping watch all night making sure the scorching beast is not hunting them. In the morning, the elders questioned Fai about what happened there in his cave. Fai was too scared to admit that he was playing with the shooting stars that gave birth to the scorching beast. So he told the elders that the beast had appeared from nowhere. And his lie was easily accepted, because people back then had no idea how fires start. That day, 
a few volunteers went back to the caves to check upon the scorching beast. They reported back that the beast seemed to have left the site, and the elders decided that the tribe is safe to return home. It was winter, and the tribe would not survive in the forest without cave roofs upon their heads, without their tools and food stored behind in the caves. They went back tentatively, everybody checking on their caves. Only Fai's family was too scared to enter the cave marked by the black breath of the scorching beast. Instead, they had to share a cave with another family, and the tribe put together some supplies for them that they could use to make their new beds. Some days passed, Nobody was talking about the scorching beast anymore, but everybody avoided being near the cave where the beast made its appearance, as if it has been cursed. But Fai could not stop thinking about what had happened there in that cave. The memory of the shooting stars and the hot tongues leaking dry leaves made him wonder and he felt guilty because all his family's winter supplies were abundant in that cave and his family now often went hungry and cold so One day, again, he said he was too sick to go into the forest to collect what little food people could find there. He made a decision to go back into his family cave to check things out. He felt that he had to do it and maybe set things right again. He felt he needed to know more about what had happened in that cave the day the scorching beast showed up. He made sure he was unnoticed and then went through the blackened entrance of his former family cave. He moved slowly and carefully, alert to any possible movement anything that would seem odd or out of place. His heart beat so fast and seemed so loud, he was afraid the sound of it would attract people's attention or wake up the scorching beast. But all except for his heart was silent. He walked by his parents and his brother's beds. They seemed untouched, cold, but familiar. He looked into the corner where his family kept their tools, some piles of various seeds, sun-dried berries and meats. The foods were disturbed by mice, yet a lot of it was still there. My family won't starve, thought Fai, and his courage rose a bit. He felt now that he was onto a good thing. His old bed, though, was not there. The beast ate my bed, thought Fai, staring at a pile of soft gray cold powder. He looked for the two rocks that shoot stars, and he found them exactly where he dropped them when the scorching beast showed up among the dry leaves of his bed. They looked innocently harmless, just like any other rocks. Five 
picked them up and without a thought banged them against each other. The tiny sparks flew into the air and the memory of his smoldering bed flashed be before Fai's eyes. Terrified, he drops the rocks, sprinted out of the cave, and did not stop until he dug himself into his new bed in the cave that was his family's new home. There, in the thin new bed, he lay trembling from cold and fear, yet soon realized that there was no beast chasing him. And then he remembered something else. He remembered how hot the beast was. And suddenly he craved that heat to help him warm himself up. The beast died when he ran out of food. He ate my bed and then he died when he finished it. I can bring the beast to life with the rocks. I can give him very little food so he cannot live long. Fai's head was spinning. He did not want to hide in bed anymore. He wanted to challenge the scorching beast he wanted to know if this was true what he thought he discovered. Stealthily, he went back to his old family cave, the cave of the magic beast, he called it now. He walked around the cave a few times, just to make sure he felt all right being there. It seemed like not such a big deal now. Fai picked up the two rocks again and banged them together a few times. Stars and no beast. He kept repeating every time he would bang the rocks. Stars and no beast. Stars and no beast. Then the boy went to his brother's bed got a small heap of fine dry grass and piled it in a new spot, away from all other beds. He banged the rocks above the small pile, letting the sparks land on top of it. Some sparks grew bigger, thin streaks of smoke rising from them. Fire remembered something else. He started blowing at the smoldering grass and finally there it was, a tiny sharp tongue of the scorching beast. The tongue licked the dry blade, jumped and multiplied into many hungry tongues, eating the pile so fast. In a few moments nothing was left of the dry grass and the beast was gone too. What remained was pleasant warmth, and Fai lingered, trying to wrap his head around what just had happened. I am the master of the scorching beast. I can make him come, I can make him stay, and I can make him go. Fai did a little warrior dance. Ash, ash, ash! He sang with every kick of his feet stomping the small pile of the warm gray powder that was all that remained from the grass eaten by the scorching beast. He wanted to share his discovery and his victory over the beast with other people of the tribe. Men of the tribe who had hunted down a big animal like a bear or an elk, proudly adorned themselves with a smear of the animal's blood across their foreheads. Fai grabbed 
a handful of soft gray powder and rubbed it onto his own forehead. When the boy walked out of the cave, he felt tall and strong. He went straight to the elders and told them that he had conquered the scorching beast. The elders did not believe him at first. But the sight of the ash on Fai's forehead made them follow the boy into the cursed cave. They watched him bring the scorching beast to life, seeing the sharp hot tongues of the beast and smelling its suffocating breath almost made them run for the woods. But they could not show a weakness to a young boy. They stayed, watched the beast eat a heap of dry leaves and die right there in front of their eyes. That day, the elders gave Fai the task of watching over the beast that they now called Fire after his name. It took Fai many, many days and months to learn and teach others how to use fire for warmth and for cooking food. And that's how fire became a part of people's life.